Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Kathleen Fulbig? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first, I'll look at the background of Kathleen Fulbig. I'll move to the timeline of the crimes, and then I'll offer my analysis. Kathleen Fulbig was born in Australia on June 14, 1967. Not even two years after her birth, her father, Thomas Britton, stabbed her mother, Kathleen Donovan, 24 times on a public footpath in Sydney. It was reported he was in a drunken rage. Kathleen was made a ward of the state and went into foster care until 1970 when she was placed in a children's home. A few months later, she received a permanent foster care placement she would remain there for several years. Kathleen would drop out of school at age 15. She married a man named Craig Gibson Fulbig in 1987. She was 20 years old and he was 25. The couple would move to Newcastle, which is north of Sydney. On February 1, 1989, Kathleen would give birth to a son named Caleb. He was diagnosed with a condition that caused him to breathe loudly. The physician said he would grow out of it, and he was healthy otherwise. When Caleb was 19 days old, Kathleen put him to sleep in a room next to her bedroom. She would find him dead a few hours later. The cause of death was believed to be SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. This is also referred to sometimes as cot death. On June 3, 1990, Kathleen would give birth to another son named Patrick. On October 18 of that same year, she put him to bed, at some point, she found that he was not breathing. He was taken to the hospital by ambulance. He was diagnosed with cortical blindness and epilepsy. Patrick would die on February 18, 1991. Kathleen called her husband at work to inform him by saying, it's happened again. The couple moved to Thornton, New South Wales, after Patrick's death. On October 14, 1992, Kathleen would give birth to a daughter named Sarah. Sarah would die on August 29. 1993. The couple once again moved, this time to Singleton. Kathleen would give birth to a daughter named Laura on August 7, 1997. Laura would die on February 27, 1999. Her husband, Craig, found her diary at this point. It appeared to have some disturbing references in it. He notified the police. Kathleen was charged with murdering all four of her children. The prosecution said Kathleen became frustrated and smothered them. The prosecution argued that the diary Kathleen kept indicated her guilt. I will cover more of the details about her diary entries in the analysis. Her husband Craig said that each death was routine and theatrical. He would wake up after hearing Kathleen scream and see her standing over the bassinet. Kathleen would remove all the photos of her children from the frames, pack away any belongings, and never mention their names after they had died. As the prosecution was playing a video of Kathleen's police interview during the trial, she attempted to flee the courtroom. She didn't make it, but she was able to delay the trial by a couple days because she was taken to the hospital and sedated. The defense said that Kathleen was innocent. Not a very surprising technique, considering that's their job. Her husband was not accused of any wrongdoing in this case, a move that Kathleen agreed with. The defense said that Kathleen didn't think he was involved in the deaths either. So she is accused of murder, and she's not implicating her husband. This closed off one avenue for reasonable doubt. So now it was natural causes versus Kathleen committing murder. There was no alternate suspect. There were no stories here about somebody breaking into the house and committing murder, nothing like that. It really did have to be either a natural cause or Kathleen. The defense, of course, was pushing the natural causes explanation. They noted that there was no physical evidence connecting Kathleen to any type of homicide. The case was circumstantial, and scientific experts did not seem to agree about what caused the deaths. The defense also tried to portray Kathleen as a caring and nurturing mother by pointing to numerous journal entries. Witnesses also testified to that effect. So the defense was trying to take those diary entries and kind of flip them around and say they actually supported the idea 
that she was not guilty. First responders said that Kathleen did appear to be authentic in her distress when they arrived, but staff at the hospital felt differently. Everybody seems to think they're an expert on appropriate emotions in these types of situations. In May 2003, Kathleen was found guilty of three counts of murder, one count of manslaughter, and one count of maliciously inflicting grievous bodily harm. In October 2003, she was sentenced to 40 years in prison with a non-parole period of 30 years. So she would have to serve at least 30 years. In 2005, her sentence was reduced on appeal to 30 years, and the non-parole period was reduced to 25 years. In 2018, the Attorney General said that an inquiry would be launched into Kathleen's convictions, saying that natural causes could have been responsible. Evidence was introduced about a rare genetic mutation that Kathleen's children had. The court ruled that her diary was quite compelling. It outweighed scientific evidence. They were going with a subjective interpretation of her emotional state based on entries in a diary as opposed to the science of genetics. On January 1, 2021, Kathleen was injured after being beaten by another inmate. Kathleen was in a particularly bad position because she had been convicted of murdering members of a vulnerable population. Prison isn't safe for anybody, but it's extra dangerous for these types of offenders. In November 2020, more scientific evidence was presented, including a published research article. The new evidence revealed a few key points. There was no indication that any of the four children died as a result of smothering. At least two of Kathleen's children had a rare genetic mutation that put them at a substantially greater risk for cardiac death. And the other two children may have had genetic mutations that could lead to death. On March 4, 2021, 90 scientists called for Kathleen Fulbig to be pardoned. Now moving to my analysis. Mental health experts testified that Kathleen did not have any disorder or symptoms that could be associated with this type of crime. For example, she did not have a personality disorder, so nothing like antisocial personality disorder. She did not have psychosis, so no disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And she did not have factitious disorder imposed on another, otherwise known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. It was determined that she did have post-traumatic stress disorder. They also suggested that she was a risk to any other children she might have, even though they did not think she was a danger to the public. Many people, including the prosecution, believed that Kathleen's diaries indicated a state of mind consistent with homicide. Here are a few examples of the entries that attracted some negative attention. One entry read, Obviously, I am my father's daughter. Again, her father stabbed her mother to death. Probably not the best connection to make. This would be like somebody charged with cannibalism bringing up the fact that they were elected president of the Army Hammer fan club. In another entry referring to Laura, Kathleen wrote, I know there's nothing wrong with her, nothing out of the ordinary anyway, because it was me, not them. That entry certainly doesn't help her case. It's not the worst, however. I think the next one is probably the most inculpatory. She went on in the same entry to talk about Sarah, writing, I knew I was short-tempered and cruel sometimes to her, and she left with a bit of help. Kathleen would later say that when she said, with a bit of help, she was talking about God offering help. Then we see this entry in which Kathleen was talking about Sarah. She wrote, all I wanted was her to shut up, and one day she did. So I'm going to guess that empathy was not Kathleen's strong suit. She talked about how stress was making her do terrible things. She described flashes of rage, resentment, and hatred toward her children. She noted feelings of depression that she had no control over. There were entries about mood swings and difficulty calming down. She wrote about how someday they will lock her up and throw away the key. So I guess she got that one right. Another area of focus in the journal entries was her struggle with her weight and how her husband perceived her weight. She was concerned that she wasn't attractive to him anymore and that he was likely to cheat. She said physical appearance was everything to him. 
so she painted him as shallow and insensitive. Her efforts to become more physically fit also drew negative attention from the prosecution. At her trial, the prosecution said that she was deeply resentful of the intrusion her children had on her life, how they interrupted her sleep, her ability to go to the gym, and her ability to socialize, including dancing. A major part of the trial was the jury trying to figure out if the journal entries really meant anything at all. Did they help the prosecution? Did they help the defense? Did they help both? This is what the jury was really trying to calculate. This was also an important part of her appeals. Kathleen would suggest that the contents of her diary were not meant to be taken literally. It very well could have been that by making the entries, Kathleen was simply trying to record the stress that she was under, detail her anxiety and depression. Perhaps it was a way of coping and not some type of confession. Now moving to the question, was Kathleen Fulbig actually guilty? I will look at this question from the perspective of the legal standard, reasonable doubt, as well as actual guilt, starting with the evidence that supports guilt. Some of the diary entries look suspicious, but I'm not convinced they actually matter much here. People write a lot of things in diaries. Some of it really has kind of a poetic feel to it, like it is not meant to be some type of record of their thoughts and feelings. It certainly doesn't seem like a confession to me when looking at the various entries. Having four children die in the same family is exceedingly rare. This, again, points to guilt. It is not surprising, considering how unusual that is, that we see a statistical argument was made in this case. The problem is that the statistical argument was flawed, consistent with what is referred to as the prosecutor's fallacy. This is a common statistical error that prosecutors make frequently. They calculate the probability of the evidence given innocence. So what are the chances that somebody who's innocent would have this evidence and try to make it seem as though it's the probability of innocence given evidence? So what are the chances this person actually did it based on the evidence? Those two probabilities are not the same thing. I will cover the prosecutor's fallacy in a separate video where I highlight the notorious case of Sally Clark where bad statistics may have resulted in a false conviction. Now moving to the evidence supporting that Kathleen Fulbig is not guilty. She denies her guilt. Her story has never changed. The research finding about the genetics is extremely compelling. There are no witnesses. The motive is weak. And none of the children were healthy before they died. They all had medical issues, which conceivably could have greatly increased the risk of death or even led to death. So with all that in mind, what about legal guilt? I think there is certainly reasonable doubt in this case. The information about the genetics alone accomplishes that. So I would say not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. As far as actual guilt, this is a little trickier in this case. I really thought about this for a while. It certainly does seem suspicious to have those four deaths, but then again with that genetic argument, it can be explained away. I would have to say probably the answer is no. I think she is probably innocent. I don't think it's something like 80% innocent, 20% guilty. I think it's like right on the line. Something like 55% innocent, 45% guilty. Again, a close call. This case is interesting because I think it's a good example of how normal grieving and coping behavior became interpreted in light of the deaths. If anybody had read those diary entries in the absence of knowing about the deaths, they probably wouldn't think anything of them. Interestingly, the medical experts in the trial, even those who had no experience with mental health, were made aware of the diary entries before they made their findings about the causes of death. I think this was a case of confirmation bias. Everybody thought they knew the answer, so they interpreted the data to fit their theory. Once they believed that she was guilty, all those other pieces just magically fell into place, even if they had to build that structure for the pieces to fall into. I think the story is a cautionary tale about the power of emotions. Everybody was enraged about the story. They were offended that somebody could do something like this. Kathleen became the object of hatred. In Australia, she's referred to as the nation's worst female serial killer. She's been called 
a monster, and, as I mentioned, attacked in prison. If she is innocent, Kathleen is living a second nightmare. The first one, of course, would be the loss of her children, and the second, her lengthy imprisonment. If one were to consider how an innocent person would act under these circumstances, Kathleen's behavior is consistent with that profile. Kathleen has been subject to a court that relies on trying to discern emotions from a diary rather than actual scientific evidence, and a court where people testified about statistics when they had really no understanding of statistical computations. I don't know if Kathleen Folbig is guilty or not, but I do know that the court is guilty of murdering logic. Those are my thoughts on the case of Kathleen Folbig. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.